You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start <laughs> Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fing guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing? A History of Comedy Podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you the mystery of Dan Ninen, one of our more mysterious characters. People uh, seem to enjoy these when we talk about you know, Dat Fan and Tom Myers and uh, Mike Warnke we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, so uh, this might be the last of the ones that I have in my back pocket of uh Bizarre characters in stand-up comedy. Well, there's always Vince Champ. I guess we could get to someday. That's true. But I was gonna say if you guys know anyone that like kind of fits this bill of the Tom Myers Dan Ninen career, and if you don't know about Dan Ninen, you're not alone. But we'll make sure you do by the end of this program. Uh, but if you have any names like that, let me know on uh, blindmike.net, which I'll tell you more about in a second. But Dan Ninen is a guy that uh, is not a household name yet makes evidently a great living in stand-up comedy, doing corporate gigs and weaseling his way into opening for big comedians and things like that. And we will tell you all about that because it is a bizarre saga. And um, credit to, we have a few clips from a guy whose channel is called uh, Oki's Weird Stories, O-K-I-S, Weird Stories. Um, I don't know if he's still making videos or not, but he did a great job breaking down uh, Dan Ninen's um, story in a much more uh, palatable, uh, like, 25-minute video. So if you want to check that out for the Reader's Digest version of what we're doing today, we're going to do a deeper dive. But check out Oki's Weird Stories for uh, the, the abridged version of what Dan Ninen's all about. Um, but there's, a, there's a segment of comedy fandom that knows who Dan Ninen is. Mm-hmm. But I feel like guys like this deserve more uh, credit because they made their mark on stand-up comedy in such a bizarre fashion. So we want to talk about Dan Ninen. And uh, like I said, if you have any characters that fit this type of storyline, um, let me know, because I want to do more episodes like this. So go to blindmike.net. You can subscribe to the Patreon and become a YouTube member, and you get uh, bonus episodes. You also get these episodes a week early. So uh, subscribe if you like the program and uh, want more of it. And uh, if you'd rather just support the show for free, then uh, you can also do that at blindmike.net. All the free links are there wherever you get podcasts, including the YouTube. If you want to, uh, you know, subscribe, leave a comment, all of that helps the show, helps build the show. Tell a friend, share us on social media, Reddit, Twitter, whatever you use, wherever you find podcasts, tell those people about us. If uh, you think they would like a history of comedy podcast like this one. So go to blindmike.net for all your links there. And also if you're jonesing for more history, then uh, Craig tells me, he says, Mike, I got an idea. What about a show where I take one segment of history and uh, break down an individual topic for an hour every week? And I said, Craig, that's brilliant. Where did you think of it? <laughs> uh, Craig, My brain's working. <laughs> Craig has started a, a true crime podcast. That's a ripoff of this one. So if you like this format, right. I think Craig's going to do the exact same thing um, without me. So what, what, where can they find that, Craig? Um, you can go anywhere you get podcasters looked up, rubbed out, and uh, or if you want to get them early, go to uh, patreon.com slash very good show. We just did a friggin' gnarly one last night. Who? Um, me, Matt, and uh, Tim. No, no, no. What's the subject? <laughs> oh, uh, her name's uh, uh, Junko Furuyama. Uh, She's from Japan, but she got uh, tortured for 44 straight days by a Yakuza member and then uh, entombed in cement and left in a park. And if you think Craig's not perceptive on these uh, true crime issues, when I asked him who he was talking about, he named the men on the podcast. So (laughs) I I think it's going to be a thorough deep dive. I thought you said with who. (laughs) Uh, So support the boys. Check all that stuff out if you'd be so kind. Now, let's get into it. Dan Ninen is, uh, I guess he's based, or at least for a time was based, in the Delaware, Maryland, Virginia area, because that's... Uh, where a lot of his scandal pops up. He ends up having beef with, uh, most na- most no- notably, Nick Mullen. Uh, that's where I discovered Dan Ninen was the old Town podcast, same way I heard about Tom Myers. Um, 
and I really think that's the only fan base that really knows if you went up to a come town fan and said the name Dan Ninen, they'd be on board and know Definitely. who you're talking about. I don't imagine a ton of other people know who this guy is. No. Um, so let's start with his, uh, his early days. Dan Ninen has an interesting story. And this is one of the clips I mentioned from our buddy Oki, um, who broke a lot of, uh, Dan's story down. He majored in general business and management at the University of Maryland. In 1996, he was hired by Intel at their corporate headquarters located in Santa Clara, California. There, he was tasked with performing technical demonstrations at Intel events around the world. Suffering from a fear of public speaking, he sought out a class that could help him ease his anxiety while on stage. Toastmasters helped, but not enough. So he joined a comedy class. In the year 2000, he took a promotion as Intel's strategic relations manager for the East Coast, which relocated him to New York City. He said that, quote, even though it paid a lot more money, I hated it. No travel, no playing with technology, and I was home based and rarely got to see any coworkers. I was absolutely bored. He says that after watching planes crash into the World Trade Center from his corner in Manhattan, and after seeing so many people die right in front of him, he realized that his life needed a change. So he left his job at Intel in order to pursue comedy full time. So he's got one of those perfect kind of um, America's Got Talent last comic standing type stories you know those reality shows it's a perfect description (laughs) they're they're looking for a guy it's weird how it worked out like that for dan nine and that he's got a perfect story um so it it seems to be one of these guys like he was just a regular schmuck stuck in a nine to fiver and then he wanted to pursue stand-up comedy and 9-11 is the event that kicked it all off for him so uh it's it's perfect for one of those schmaltzy reality shows where they're like hey not only is this guy funny, but he makes you want to root for him. Uh, the other thing I find interesting about that clip is that uh, remember the year 2000, uh, Oki told us he got a promotion in the year 2000. I feel like that's important to remember, given what he claims his age is. Correct. So, <laughs> so just make sure you keep that in mind as well as we go along. Uh, so what's next? Uh, we have his opener. Oh, we're getting into his comedy. Good. We're going to hear more about the story we just heard about working for Intel and everything soon. Uh, But I wanted to give you guys a taste for Dan's comedy. So 9-11 happens, and obviously he says, it's time to get into comedy, I guess. Some people said, let's, let's, you know, put on our boots and (laughs) head to the Middle East. Dan said, America needs to laugh again, I guess. Uh, So this is the type of comedy that Dan is known for. And I'll say this. Uh, I'll set it up this way. Dan's a true hack. <laughs> I hope I'm not spoiling anything for anyone. Maybe I should have let you get there on your own. But what's interesting about Dan, um, the reason we're talking about him is more his backstory. Whereas Tom Myers, I'm fascinated, like, how do you get to bong hit transplant? How does a mind get there? Right. Dan is a little simpler in terms of his material, which we'll hear here. So you're, uh, so you're probably wondering... What race is that guy anyway? 30 minutes of applause. Good lord. Jesus. That, hold on a second. Now that he's getting a standing ovation. What race is that guy? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Pause. He hasn't said anything. All he said, you're probably wondering what race is that guy anyway. There's not a punchline yet. And they're in his They're going nuts for this guy. So people love Dan Ninen so far. That's good. (laughs) And my mom is from Japan. Oh, go back just a little bit. You need to to the proper set. All right. My dad is from India. And my mom is from Japan. I get my sushi from 7-Eleven. <laughs> oh, Danny. Oh, oh, my. I'm like Harold and Kumar. Was Harold Japanese? I don't even know. I don't, th- I don't think I, that's right, actually. I think he was Korean, actually. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, it doesn't matter, I guess. Uh, yeah, so that's the the level of humor you get from Dan Nine, and That's probably his most famous joke. It's the one... Uh, Nick Mullen certainly fixated on 
is that he gets his sushi from 7-Eleven, which again, doesn't really make, I mean, I don't think 7-Eleven sells sushi, but let's not get too bogged down in the details. <laughs> Uh, we got a couple more gems from Dan Nine. Is this the glazed donut joke? Uh, yes. Some people. This is, it, this, this is fascinating because it comes up later because Dan swears this is a true story. So I'm driving with my parents one day and we see these cows grazing in a field. So my dad says, now there is a word that can have a lot of different meanings. Graze. For example, <laughs> for example, a cow can graze. And then I say, or you can be grazed by a bullet. And then my mom says, or it's a kind of a donut. <laughs> Well, and if you don't get that, you're not racist. So, right. <laughs> so that's a feather in your cap, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so here's what's weird about that is that that's like a basic street joke that it feels like. You know, that feels like just an old racist proverb that has been passed <laughs> down through generations. Dan swears this is true that he and his family were driving around and saw a cow. And when his father sees a cow, his immediate response is, now there's a word that could have a lot of meanings. To which you would say, cow? Right. And no, of course he means graze, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> which, is that, by the way, is that what you say when you see words that have a lot of, see words, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> see things that could have other meanings, I guess. I don't know. That's a bizarre hill to die on that that's a true story it's like that's fine hey i just made a dumb joke when i was a young 75 year old comedian uh but <laughs> he, sw he swears that story's true and that's where we start peeling the layers of dan Ninen is the fact that he says that that happened and he will die on that hill um i think we have uh, one more joke from danny right yeah but uh names oh well this is <laughs> again um I'll give Dan this credit is that he's not an original hack. He, he has old schmaltzy. Va if, uh, you know, half Indian, half Japanese guys were allowed in vaudeville comedy, Dan would have fit right in back in the day. If they were allowed to walk into bars, but yeah, right. <laughs> but this doesn't, it still doesn't quite make sense to me, but I'll, uh, I'll let him let it fly. But I'm just glad my parents gave me an easy to pronounce name like Daniel Ninen. Instead of some weird combination Indian Japanese name like Sanjay Hajimoto. <laughs> or Mahatma Mitsubishi. Yes, because his last name changes at birth. Thank you. I'm so glad you said that because I was like, <laughs> did none of these people notice that his his last name would always be Ninen? <laughs> No matter what. <laughs> yes, those that you're firing off some stereotypical Japanese and Indian names. The last Ninen is somewhere in there, evidently. It's I assume your father's Indian. So Right. It's an Indian name, I guess, right? Judging by the glazed grazed joke. Yeah. Well, luckily his parents didn't change his last name, change the family lineage. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the type of comedy that uh dan nine and even that is it was some show hosted by tim conway if you know who tim conway is and he introduced them. this is like part of part of dan's reel like his you know acting reel or audition reel whatever is tim conway introducing him on this show and tim conway just says this guy boy he's terrific ladies and gentlemen dan nine and dan uses that in promotions to say like Tim Conway is a fan of mine. And what's interesting about, and still to this day, go, uh, if you Google Dan Ninen right now, you'll find old videos. Um, I'm sorry, search on YouTube rather. You'll find his videos. He hasn't updated uh, this page in a long time, but his old videos are all Russell Peters opener. Dan Ninen makes, you know, joke X. Uh, or Robert Schimmel's opener, Dan Ninen. So I will say, um, like we said about Dane Cook, 
if you're going to compliment Dan for one thing, it has to be his marketing ability because he was 10 years before anyone knew what algorithms were. Dan was on top of the YouTube algorithm. He knows, hey, I throw Russell Peters' name in here. It's going to get more views than just saying Dan Nine and tells jokes. Uh, and we'll get more into Russell Peters and Robert Schimmel and Mark Marin and some of the other comics he's brushed elbows with. But uh, Dan was a great marketer because he got his name out there in various ways. Um, so let's let's hear more about the life of Dan Ninen. Yeah, the, the next thing um, that we have in our order is the Daily Beast article. But unfortunately, it's locking me out of it right now. Oh, no. It's saying it I need just to good be- to go two days ago. I know. It's <laughs> saying I need to be a member to read it. Okay, well, just give us the title if you could. Uh, let me pull it up again maybe at I'll the very least because i can uh, i can i can give you the gist of it uh it is uh, mo- oh, i didn't think this would take this long the title uh, is <laughs> millennial comedian is 55 years old essentially yeah. is what they're saying correct so the daily beast covered uh dan Ninen about 10 years ago or so and said that um you know, Dan Nine's popping up in all of these articles. There, there are articles being written more to speaks more to uh, Dan's marketing ability that he would wedge his way into like these local news pieces and, you know, Buzzfeed type stuff and blogs and things where they would have Dan Nine on these lists of like top comics under 30 or, uh, you know, all the, uh, the you know, Buzzfeed's the perfect example because they do these kinds of lists. And Dan Ninen's name was always popping up and he was doing these interviews where it's like, Dan, as a 30 year old in the big city, how's dating? <laughs> so the Daily Beast uncovered that Dan, in fact, at this time, and this is about a decade ago now, is 55 years old. Um, that was also uncovered in an, a, a physical altercation, which we'll get to, that Dan had at a comedy club. The police report showed Dan's real age. Um, so that will come up later. But. I just felt that speaks a little more to Dan's character. We are like, I mean, credit that he can pass as 30, I guess. But what's interesting about Dan is he never keeps his lies straight. There's all these, there's all these different articles. He'll do all these interviews and one will say it's because Dan's not a very uh, forward thinker. So if so, you know, he'll audition for something uh, where the, the character is a 20 something and Dan will say, I'm 29 years old. And then if something else says, hey, we're looking for the best comics in their 30s, Dan will be like, as a matter of fact, I'm 34. That's interesting. (laughs) So Dan can't keep his lies straight. So there's all these these articles that are printing different ages for Dan Ninen. And meanwhile, he's minimum 20 years older than any of them are saying. (laughs) So so that's a fascinating part of that. Uh, What's next? Um, That from... Back to that uh, YouTube channel talking about his lies. Uh, okay, good. Let's hear a little more about that because I think it gets into uh, some of the story we heard earlier about his experience at Intel and leaving because of 9-11. Because in a New York Post article from 2009 called Second Acts, Dan says he was fired from Intel, not that he was compelled to quit after witnessing 9-11. In a Business Insider article called Five People Who Radically Altered Their Careers After 9-11, it says... On September 11th, Dan was able to watch both towers fall from his corner in Manhattan, New York City. After watching so many people die right in front of him, he realized that he needed a change. He left his job to pursue comedy full time. So yet again, this time from a Huffington Post blog, it says that he was laid off in 2007, which doesn't really make sense because there is definite proof that he was well into his comedy career by that point. So Dan, which one was it? Were you fired from Intel in 2007? Or did 9-11 compel you to quit and pursue a comedy career? See, he's not quite thinking in the internet age where people can track this stuff. He right. tells one person I left on 9-11. He tells another person I got laid off in 2007 because they fit those individual narratives, not realizing these can be cross-checked. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very funny. And the other thing, I, the other reason I said keep, keep an eye on his age in the year 2000 is because uh, the first article says that he got promoted in the year 2000. Now, I would suggest that that means he's at least 23 years old in the year 2000. In that position uh, that he got promoted to, you're not going to be younger than 30. 
I, probably not, but I'm saying if you, ha- you, I assume you have to be college educated. You would have had to work there for some time to get a promotion. So let's say Correct. a year. You got to be at least 23. Minimum. <laughs> Absolute minimum. So most of these articles where uh, Dan is uh, claiming he's 29 years old are eh, 13 to 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so he would at least be in his late 30s which again he, he's not i mean i don't know why i'm dancing around it the man is in his 50s at this time <laughs> like there's just proof of that yeah uh so he, he continues to the uh the cheese gets more binding as we work our way into this <laughs> as uh robert schimmel so this is a this is a fascinating one this is a little taste i think this is the come town guys hinting at it and I couldn't find more specific details. Um, by the way, uh, I should have said this at the, at the beginning. If you guys know more about what Dan Ninen is currently up to and can fill in any of the blanks that we miss, let me know. I figured we would do this episode. We actually did this on Patreon like three months into the, like it was one of the early things we did on our Patreon. Pre Why Are You Laughing? Yes, before Why You Laughing existed. I figured we, we'd redo it with a little of the Why You Laughing brand and, uh, you know, ixnay some of the dead weight. Uh, so, so, so go to the Patreon and see uh, how Act 1 was. See how our rehearsal was uh, three years ago. and um, Or two years ago, I guess. And uh, uh, let me know. if It's, pretty, it's, a, it's a lot of the same clips and everything. Um, mm. Because I don't know what Dan Ninen's up to lately, I couldn't find any real concrete updates so if you guys know let me know and we will do a, a dan nine in part two and update people uh, um, but this is a vague allusion to something involving robert schimmel and i'll fill in the blanks as much as i can after we hear it uh, apparently i don't know if this is true or not but i'm sure it is knowing dan but when robert schimmel died dan emailed schimmel's brother and was like yeah, Robert was a fucking asshole and a piece of shit. What? <laughs> That's yeah. terrible. Oh, yeah, man. Dan's a sociopath. He's a fucking piece of shit. Well, he also said that. <laughs> it's a psychotic move. So he, his, his, he, he opened for Robert Schimmel. And still, I, I keep, I'm about to say this to this day every time. And by that, I mean 2015, 2016, the last time Dan Nine was really heard from. Um, he would keep mentioning and kind of bragging about opening for robert schimmel and yet the story is that when dan died uh he emailed jeff's uh, i'm sorry uh, robert's brother uh, dressing robert down for because robert schimmel was a guy who caught on to dan ninen's act <laughs> he realized i believe what was happening with dan ninen and we'll describe that more in a minute but essentially um Dan Ninen would find out where Robert was opening, um, call the club as Robert's manager, book himself as the opening act, and eventually I think Robert caught on to that, as other comics did, which we'll get into. So I don't want to go too in-depth on that just yet. But this is the first taste we get of Dan's emails. Dan's a very aggressive emailer. He's a clean comic because he claims that uh, Seinfeld told him to be. (laughs) <laughs> a, a, a meeting he had with Seinfeld, Jerry told him to be a clean comic, and so he is. Um, but his emails are not so clean. He has a very dirty email history. Is uh, Marin? Yeah. Okay. So Mark Marin. This is a little longer. Mark Marin gets a little more in depth uh, with Dan's emails. So at this time, keep in mind, um, this is before Rogan really took off. Mark Marin's the king of podcasting. If you're a comedian, you want to be on WTF with Mark Marin, And uh, Dan was no exception to that rule. Here's the first one. Subject line. Oh, sorry. Let me. I, I should set it up a little bit. Because Marin didn't want to give Dan the, uh, the bump he was looking for. So he didn't say his name. So to be fair, we don't know officially that it's Dan Ninen. There's some clues that I'll get to that suggest it is Dan Ninen. Um, but... As of right now, Mark Marin is just talking about an unnamed comedian. Here's the first one. Subject line. Prick, fuck, alt comics who don't earn any money doing comedy who give advice. I'd like to be on your podcast. Subject. How I stopped listening to bitter, jaded, angry, dysfunctional, prick, fuck, alt village comics who tell me not to do my style of comedy and now earn 
over $250,000 a year without ever having a drink, drug, cigarette, or prescription drug, and without a single credit, in quotes, meaning a TV credit, without a manager or agent, and without being passed at a single club in the city. So this guy is basically saying, put me on your show. I've done nothing that normal comics do to pay their dues and find their own voice. And I have somehow figured out a way to make a quarter million dollars a year and having nobody heard of me. Congratulations. Then I get another email because I didn't respond to that one. P.S. One of my YouTube videos is about to hit 900,000 views. Wow. There are cats that have more views than that. Then this. This is the one that got me, by the way. We'll pay you $1,000 cash if you put me on your podcast. And I'm dead serious. I did not respond to these things because I went and looked at his stuff. There was a lot of him opening for other people, a lot of celebrities bringing him on. Uh, he's got a lot of footage of corporate gigs that he does with people bringing him on at corporate gigs. Did not respond to that. Yeah, so it's Dan to a T, it seems. To a T. Um, again, we'll get to why that's not you might be saying mike that, that could be anybody but we'll get to why uh people are so certain it's dan nine and in a minute um but this is what's interesting is that dan is he feels entitled and he feels he's been bullied we heard on come town just there where they're calling him a piece of shit and everything and that was kind of the mo of the washington dc comedy scene that dan was a part of dan wasn't respected and I bet he did make a lot of money. I don't know that he made as much money as he claims, uh, but those corporate gigs pay a lot. And it as you heard, so much. as you heard in those first couple of clips, Dan's perfect for those. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you don't know what those corporate gigs are, it's you know name your big company, putting on some sort of retreat or convention or something, where they're like, hey, before we get into the the nitty gritty, let's let our hair down and have a comic on. And it's just ideally what they want is some bland, uh, you know, hokey comedian that won't be offensive, won't ruffle any feathers, won't cause trouble, uh, isn't going to have a litany of complaints from employees. And so Dan Nine is perfect for that. And those pay a good deal of money. Um, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are like, oh, like rolling their eyes or whatever. But from the uh you know from the employer's standpoint dan's perfect for those so i he's, bet he does he's safe for money. all the stuffy white guys yeah and that's that's why i wanted to show his comedy is that he's not like so bad it's good like tom myers he's perfect for corn balls that are like oh back to the back to the salt mines huh like those type of working stiffs that just need a fucking anything from their miserable lives to laugh what race is that guy got the biggest laugh I've ever heard in my life? <laughs> I do wonder, like the amount of time he's prowling the stage makes me think it's real. Because if he was bombing and inserting laughs, he wouldn't just have silence for that long. True. But that was a tremendous ovation he got just for what race is that guy anyways? <laughs> I mean, I, unless like everyone there was legitimately thinking that as he said it. Yeah. Oh, so anyways, my point with saying that was, uh, those corporate guys, like I just explained what they were, which is probably evidence that you're not going to know most of them, you know, um, most of them that are great at that and exclusive. Now, a guy like Nate Bargetsy and Jim Gaffigan and people like that probably also get hired for a lot of corporate events, but they're real comics. A guy like Dan is never going to break through in real comedy. He's never going to have a special on Netflix or anything. There's just not an audience for it. I can't wait for the podcast where he talks about sitting at the table with Patrice. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did back in the day, and Patrice gave him a lot of advice. Um, but Dan doesn't like that he never got that respect from his peers. And I don't know if you could tell, but it seems like in his emails to Marin, that bothered him a little bit. And I, I don't think that was the last of it. No, this is a response. <laughs> P.S. $1,000 should buy lots of Coke. <laughs> Marin's yeah, notoriously been sober for years. <laughs> that's a very funny PS. I'm going to give him credit for that. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Here's what's weird about Dan Nine is he always goes after like that, like his thing with Nick, like Nick Mullins, a drunk, and this person's a drunk, and he he's high all the time, and it's like that's a weird thing to go at comedians for because they're almost sure. exclusively degenerates in some way, you know. Sure, for sure. But he he gets very yeah. hung up on that. One thousand dollars should buy lots of coke. 
Oh, the audacity and entitlement of this fucking guy just drove me nuts. So I wrote, I'm not going to say his name. I appreciate that you want to be on the show. I will not have you on the show. Your tone is entitled and insulting, and you can't buy your way onto my show. If you listen to me or the podcast, you would know that I don't do drugs and haven't for years. I'm excited to share your emails in this email exchange on the show and talk about how I feel right now. I hope that will get you the attention and validation you are looking for. Thanks, Marin. So after I wrote back to him, he goes, ha ha. But as you yourself would say, they're just words, right? Funny how that's what it took to get a response. Just make sure you spell my name right. How about $5,000? <laughs> and then he goes on to write, I'll give you a little background. As a working comedian who makes a living. Can I say, by the way, sorry, real quick. Can I just say, this is oddly confrontational for a guy that doesn't know Mark Maron. He's acting like Mark Maron is one of these people that uh, has taken umbrage with him over the years. It's Mark weird to be this angry at Mark Maron for not having it. Like, if I just reached out to Joe Rogan and was like, why the fuck haven't you had me on yet? Yeah, like their tones <laughs> should be swapped. <laughs> yeah, it's very odd. I will admit Marin gets a little high and mighty when he's talking about, uh, you know, the prestige of uh, real comics and everything. But, you know, I can understand getting these emails a little jarring. You're like, what the fuck is this? What's the matter with this guy? <laughs> yeah. I'll give you a little background. As a working comedian who makes a living doing what I love, earning as much as $15,000 for an hour's work, I'm absolutely sick and tired of quote-unquote comedians who tell me that I shouldn't be doing the material I'm doing. They tell me I shouldn't be doing ethnic comedy, that I shouldn't be doing impressions, that I shouldn't be doing corporate stuff. And what makes this ironic is that many of these people have never earned a single dollar doing comedy. Okay. He's very uh, hung up on money, and he thinks that that's uh, kind of the, the mark of a comedian. He's saying, like, I make all these money, all, all this money on corporate gigs. Why won't Mark Maron have me on? Why don't my peers accept me? It's this, um, it's a young boy trapped in a man's body, like a kid that was bullied, screaming to be accepted. And he hasn't found that yet. And he's going, uh, all the, all the wrong, all the worst ways you could about trying to get that acceptance. Um, and there is one last response here. All right people who are only doing comedy as an unpaid hobby experts on the art of comedy. What gives them the right to tell another artist the type of material he or she shouldn't or shouldn't be doing? It's like a heavy metal artist telling another musician that he shouldn't do country music or Rembrandt telling Monet not to do impressionist paintings. <laughs> This guy's got a pretty lofty idea of who he is in the world. <laughs> if this were an occasional problem, I could deal with it, but I'm sick and tired of being hammered day in and day out by these negative loser drug addicts and alcoholics. Last time I checked, this is a free country, and I have the right to do whatever kind of comedy I feel like doing. And I think comedians, <laughs> points, comedians points to Dan would be, yeah, you do have the right to do that. We're going to make fun of you, of course, but you're making fun of us. You're saying we're losers and degenerates. So we can all have our opinions of each other and just go about our day. Like we're never going to respect you and you're never going to respect us. Apparently that's the weird thing about Dan Nine is he wants to be part of this crew that he is labeling as drug addicts and degenerates and losers. And uh, you know, people who aren't real comics by Dan's own admission. So it, it's, it's a, uh, um, it seems like a childhood wound that will never be uh, properly healed. Correct. Uh, there is uh, like 40 seconds left in this clip. There's more. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right, Marin, let's hear more. <laughs> to him, I said, I know exactly who you are and what you are saying. And congrats on all your success. It is a free country and I will never put you on my podcast. You arrogant, entitled, miserable person. <laughs> if you are a comic, I'm glad that you're doing so well with it. It's sad that you're so angry and you, you, that you have no credits <laughs> and nobody knows who you are. Uh, it is sad, in fact. <laughs> it's sad you have no credits. <laughs> like, I, like I said, we'll, we'll get to why that is so Dan Nine in a minute. I can understand you hearing that and being like, that could be fucking anybody. It just could be an angry guy, I guess. Uh, but Dan has a bit of a pattern, which we'll get to. Yep. The uh, next clip is uh, websites and um, um, 
Russell Peters on specifically Ro- Russell Peters. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, an interesting thing, and we're gonna hear from Russell Peters at the end. Our first breadcrumb as to how these things are all connected. Um, Dan, Dan, I said it was a great marketer and uh, knew his way around a website. And there's some Asian American comedians that have uh, had their struggles with dealing with Dan Ninen in the past. Dan has a track record of making almost exact replicas of Asian comedians' websites and replacing their contact information with his own. When someone would try to book a comedian he did this to, such as Paul Verghese, Omar Shakat, or Esther Ku, they'd end up on the phone with him instead. Esther wrote on Twitter that he tried to sell her website back to her, and Omar Shakat even has evidence of this on the About section of his site. Dan also did a similar thing to Russell Peters. Here's what Russell had to say about him on the Pause jo- one second. We'll hear from Russell in a minute. But so essentially Dan would get get their website or what he would do with well here with Russell Peters is very interesting. I assume that's what he was doing with some of these other people, but mm-hmm. he would make it look like his website was their website. So he would take over Esther Koo's website in some form or fashion and make people believe that it was Esther Koo's website and say, hey, Esther Koo's busy today. But if you want a great comic, you know who you should hire? Dan Ninen. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan may be the vo- most victimized human being in America because what Dan claims is that all these websites would have Dan's contact information and confirmed to be Dan's email and phone number and all the ways to contact Dan. And Dan was saying it's weird because he's not the one doing that. So some you know genius marketer is taking over all these websites and routing it back to dan ninen including the website of one russell peters as he tells mr rogan here experience well, somebody did that to my website to they else, made really? uh, uh, my russell peters.com they put a russell peters.com with one l and then they completely uh, cut and pasted all my shit from my website to that one Brilliant. What were they? Were they doing anything? It was this fucking douchebag guy. I don't want to even say his name because I don't want to give him any credit. But he he thinks he's a comic and he's a a fucking douche. Uh, So he did that just to fuck with you? Yeah, because then people because you would go to contact info and he had his number there. What? He opened for me like like three times or something, and it wasn't like I asked him to open for me. He would like he would like sort of stalk me and be like, "Hey, I see you're going to be in Indiana this Friday." I'm going to be in town there on Thursday night doing a corporate. Do you mind if I do a set on the Friday? You don't have to pay me or anything. Wow. Okay. Wow. Well, wow. That worked like three times. And I was like, wait a minute. Russell, the fuck are you always where I'm going to be the day before? Russell, yeah. I just love the image of Russell Peters showing up. And by the way, if you don't know Russell Peters, um, internationally, I think he makes more money than Kevin Hart. Like he might be the biggest comic in the world. He's when you see those lists of uh, like highest paid comedians, he dwarfs Seinfeld some years. Like, yeah, he makes a ton of money. And the idea of Russell Peters walking into these venues and being like, Dan Ninen here again. <laughs> <laughs> you always like, around. I just love the idea that the first couple of times he's like, ah, that's weird. Dan Ninen's here. And then the third time he's like, okay, I think I see what's happening. <laughs> something's, something's amiss. Yeah, but. What's interesting there and the reason um, the, the picture starting to come together is that uh, Russell Peters in that episode of Rogan confirms the guy that Mark Marin is talking about is the same guy that did this to him. He says, me and Mark talked off air and Russell did the same thing where he's like, I don't want to give this guy credit. That's pretty much all he's looking for is for me to say his name on this platform. So I'm not going to do it, but it's the same guy that Mark Marin was talking about. And the reason people are pretty certain that the guy that both of these men are talking about is Dan Ninen is because uh, when that Daily Beast article came out, Russell Peters tweeted out and basically said, ha ha. <laughs> he was <laughs> taking sort of a victory lap that Dan was down on his luck. So it seems like either someone is, has been targeting Dan Ninen by promoting him you know what I mean? Like yeah. someone's harassing Dan Ninen through the outlet of getting Dan gigs and impersonating him. Or Dan is doing this. It's a pattern that Dan has done to all these comedians. 
including like Esther Ku, who's again, that's a third name who Esther Ku said, this guy did this to me and he tried to sell me my own website back to me. Um, so and she straight up tweeted his name and everything. Yeah. And so I, that, that's the other thing is like, okay, if you want to say Dan's not the guy with Russell and Marin, well, he's certainly the guy with Esther Ku. So why would his name be popping? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Uh, but we continue. Uh, yeah, here we have um, uh, the Josh Rogan incident. <laughs> so this is what I mentioned about um, his uh, legal entanglements that uh, revealed his age a little bit. Um, he was playing a uh, club in D.C. Josh Rogan, which, by the way, his name came up for something in the last few years. I can't remember what, but there was some news story that Josh Rogan broke. Um, but at the time, he was evidently uh, covering comics, and he gave a review of Dan Ninen, and Dan didn't care for it. November 25th, 2013, Dan Ninen punched a Daily Beast reporter named Josh Rogan in the face during a show at the DC Improv after he criticized his act on Twitter. The criticism itself was mild. All he had to write to set Dan off was, Dan Ninen was funny until he dusted off his 2005 Katrina jokes in a gratingly bad George W. Bush impression. Dan Ninen makes his upteenth joke about how Asians can't distinguish between the letters L and R. <laughs> Election, erection, we get it. After being assaulted, Josh Rogan informed his followers with a blunt tweet. Dan Ninen just punched me in the face. Not a joke. <laughs> this was followed by, we are calling the police on Dan Ninen, who just punched me twice in front of several witnesses. <laughs> DC police arrested Dan Ninen for assaulting me. Later, Rogan told the full story to the press. Quote, Dan Ninen comes over to me and says, are you Josh Rogan? And I said, yes. And then he punched me in the jaw. And then he pushed me. Then he walked away, and about 10 seconds later, he came over and he punched me again. <laughs> After he was arrested, someone found the police report and exposed his real age. Regardless, it's 52, so, 52 when he got arrested. Which is uh, 2013, so he's in his yeah. 60s right now, allegedly. Who knows? Maybe yes, the police he, got it wrong. He was 41 when he was 23 getting that job promotion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Is he, he was an older gentleman when he left Intel for to pursue comedy. <laughs> Um, so, so, uh, yeah, that, that's the kind of temper that Dan has is the mildest criticism. And, that, and that's, what's weird about all of this is like, I'm sure some people could be pretty mean. Like we heard Mullen call him a piece of shit and all that, mm -hmm. but I think there's a build up there. You know, I think a lot of this starts with just saying like, yeah, he's doing hack material. And I didn't even clip his impressions, by the way, he does Bush Clinton and I guess Obama. That's what he says anyways. Um, but it's the, it's the hackiest. And literally he's making, um, you know, he'll make a joke about like the Monica Lewinsky thing or something. And it's like, and this is in, you know, 2010. And it's just like, oh God, he's the, he's the hackiest guy, which is fine. If that's how, if you're making money doing that, good for you to steal. God bless you. Mm. What's weird is he has such pride in his comedy. And he thinks like he's doing, he can, he compared himself to fucking Rembrandt or whatever he said in that Marin email. So that's, what's fascinating about Dan is if you criticize him and say he's doing hack material, like saying Asians can't differentiate between the word election and erection, uh, then he's going to punch you in the face. <laughs> it's as heck as it gets. Yeah. Uh, next we have, we're going to go to the, uh, the great medium Tumblr. Yes. Very, very, uh, very prominent this time. And uh, this is a comic who exposed a lot of the emails. Um, what's this gentleman's name, Craig? Uh, this is um, Brian McGinnis. Brian McGinnis, that's it. He, uh, he is one of many comics that received a flurry of emails. And uh, this is a, a, guy, a guy named Joe Robinson, um, who's, uh, again, a Baltimore comedian uh, who's dealt with Dan. He basically said, like, Marin was reacting to a handful of emails. Joe Robinson claims he would get, like, 70 emails a week from Dan Ninen That's without insane. responding. Insane. In the same tone. Like, hey, motherfucker. Uh, call, you know, you're, you're a failure. I drive a Tesla. Um, that's another thing he brags about is, like, how, you know, how rich he is. He posts pictures from exotic places. Uh, he's big on the Tesla thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like he, he brings his Tesla keys around and, uh, would post pictures of him in front of a Tesla and, 
Uh, which at that time, I guess, was a big status symbol. Now I get in Tesla that, Ubers. But that, and he would post pictures of him on, like, private jets and stuff. Private jets, that's another big one where it's like, you know, you can't afford a bus ticket. I'm on a private jet. He's t- He talks some good shit. I'll give him that. He's a great shit talker. <laughs> Maybe he would have been fine at the table. Yeah, right. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, let's hear uh, some these Brian McGinnis emails. I thought were a good example of what he would do because he Brian McGinnis posted 34 emails that he got from Dan Nynan. And these which are by any not, metric is an insane amount. It's insane, and these are not just to Brian McGinnis. These are mass sent out. Yes, I'm sorry. Brian McGinnis was part of the group email that I think Nick Mullen was a part of. Uh, JL Coven was one of his big enemies. Joe Robinson, all all, all these uh, Baltimore area comedians would get this this group email and it was just kind of like um i guess it's like how i for some reason get emails from the new york times every day and i don't know how to stop it and i don't know why it started yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it was like that but with threats from a fellow comedian <laughs> yeah. uh, email number one here from dan Ninen, comedian subject eight thousand dollars for a show in dubai may i gloat <laughs> just a little bit thank you that is the subject line good good <laughs> Long subject, by the way, but good. Yes. Uh, uh, Dear friends, I just received the initial deposit for a corporate show in Dubai that's coming up in a couple weeks. The show pays $8,000. Yes, that's right. $8,000 for less than one (laughs) hour's work. And yes, I'll be flying first class as usual. No one asked about this, by the way. (laughs) In unbelievable luxury with a flatbed. I'll be checking out the indoor ski range, surfing on the sand dunes. Visiting the tallest building in the world, uh, in the world's largest shopping mall, and uh, luxuriating luxur- whatever, by the pool at my five-star hotel. And yes, I will send pictures. Oh, how exciting. Uh, I know I shouldn't be gloating, and I know I should be spending my time working on my book in preparation for my upcoming meeting with my literary agent. Okay. Yeah. So this is just, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of boasting and bragging. Can we skip ahead to the next email? Because I just want to give people a taste of the emails he was sending to this group. I am scrolling so much and I'm still on the first email. Uh, Jesus okay. Christ. All right. Uh, email two. Um, Dan Nine and Comedian. Again, no subject. Oh, uh, watch me perform for 4,000 people introduced by Tim Conway. Uh, <laughs> That's the video we, sh- so. So what Joe Robinson did is played on his podcast. I guess someone may um, redid that video or maybe it was a different set, but I think it was the Tim Conway video, but they cut the laughs out the way people do with like the Big Bang Theory or Seinfeld even. Yeah. So it's Dan Ninen saying like, what race is that guy anyways? And just kind of wandering the stage for 30 seconds. Yeah. (laughs) Which is pretty funny. And that Joe Robinson played that on his podcast and Dan was livid about that. I I was getting laughs. And so he, he he needs to correct the record here. Actually, I think it might be funnier to just read the subjects. Can we do that? Um, I, I so I just realized I made a mistake. Email two, there's no subject. It just gets okay. right into it. Just all says, right, all right. But it's that. Watch watch me with Tim Conway. <laughs> um, email number two, me classy? No, I'll tell you who's classy. City Comics, who? And this is just a bullet point interview. Uh, email. Ah, uh, uh, good. Uh, one destroy themselves with drugs, alcohol, prescription drugs, and cigarettes. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two facilitate the murder of policemen, judges, and other innocent victims all over the world by using Facil- illegal drugs. <laughs> Who did that? I don't know. Uh, sexually harass female comedians to the point where females don't want to do comedy. That one might be true. Um, yeah, I guess we're you know, this guy's not all bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do rape jokes they consider quote clever. Uh, mercilessly pick on audience members for their physical attributes or race to the point where the people don't want to sit in the front or avoid comedy clubs altogether. But here's, here's the thing. Dan's criticizing how all these people do comedy, which is f- great. Fine. I don't agree with his stance on it, mm-hmm. but he hates the way they do comedy. He has a long list of reasons why the way they do things yeah. suck. Yet Dan's not satisfied with living in the world where he hates them and they hate him. Yeah. He need, he thinks he's going to change their mind, and that's what these emails are. So that's that's all I really wanted to show you. You can go to uh, just Google Brian McGinnis, Dan Nine, and Tumblr, and it should pop right up for you. Um, I wish he had the subjects on all of these emails. It's just the well, first. One. I, I think it. Uh, I think it's pretty. I think the Marin thing pretty much cleared it up. That's <laughs> that's the tone of all of these. Yeah. So yeah, all the signs would point to 
uh, Dan Nine and be, being this guy, but he doesn't really cop to any of it. So mm-hmm. where are we now? Uh, our last stretch here, we got um, five clips left, all from the Nobody Loves Onions. Nobody okay, Likes yeah. Onions. Uh, so interview. so uh, a segment of our uh, viewership and listenership uh, may have been turned on to Patrick Milton recently because he's gotten into the world of uh, you know, Stuttering John and Kevin Brennan and all these people. But Patrick Melton's a guy who's been grinding in the podcast world for a long, long very, time. Very long time. He's been doing it forever, and he does these long, long shows. So uh, Patrick Melton's a comic. I don't know exactly how he's tied up in that in that um, Joe Robinson, Nick Mullen type of world, but he had these guys on his guests, uh, J.L. Coven. They all mentioned Dan Nine's name and kind of made fun of him. So um, Patrick and Dan Ninen got in touch, and Patrick said, why don't you come and do my podcast? So this is a three-hour, three-and-a-half-hour podcast where uh, Joe Robinson's on the phone for most of it. Um, but uh, Patrick Melton does a pretty good job breaking Dan down. Some of it I don't have because it's very long and convoluted. The, the Three hours and 20 minutes long. Dan's responses to some of the accusations were so long and repetitive and didn't get anywhere um that i would recommend if you're interested enough in this go check out nobody likes onions the 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 full interview um i just have a few clips that kind of sum dan up and we get to hear his response to some of the things we talked about here yeah this first one is uh hillary and obama oh so well, let me set that up um he has in his uh as part of his promotional reel <laughs> Like I said, he has Tim Conway introducing him. Another thing he has is like this compilation of like Steve Wozniak and Barack Obama and all the not comedic figures, but gigantic names saying like Dan Ninen's great. And the clip with Obama is Dan Ninen is bleep funny. And I think they talk about that a little in the clip, exactly how that came to be and there's also a clip of him being like hey i performed for hillary clinton and his proof of that is it's a picture that shows him at a podium and then later hillary at that same podium there's no proof that she was in the room while dan performed or even even if she was there's no evidence that she enjoyed it in any way and it might have been the same day well my, my third tag to that would be let's say she was in the room and enjoyed it the fuck does that matter? Doesn't. Does <laughs> Hillary not. Clinton's comedy opinion is a, a valueless thought to me. Yeah. So I, I, it's a weird brag, but Dan's idea is like, hey, people will see this thing where I'm performing for Obama and Hillary and, and Waz, and they're going to love it. So that's what uh, Patrick Melton's asking him about here. Anyways. He goes, Dan is, and he started to say funny, and for some reason he stopped and he said hilarious, right? So he didn't say effing hilarious no but this is in your signature you see so this is what this is where it all starts i think is this embellishment of like click here to watch obama call me effing hilarious right but think about it i mean what how could you not click on that that's the idea is to get them to click on that right yeah but it's a lie right i mean (laughs) that's not what he says right but i mean you know and also it's very apparent that you rushed him and were like come on say i'm funny like and it's shake this is why people i think don't think it's genuine uh, or that it's misleading uh when you say i performed for hillary clinton and your proof of that is you at a podium and then it just cuts to her at the same podium right well we were she even in the room nobody even knows maybe yeah. you didn't perform for hillary yeah i mean she it got just rushed in at the last minute by secret service and for her speech and then left <laughs> yeah it, it, great point that all makes sense and I will say, here's my like minor defense of Dan is like, if he's in a situation where he can run up to Obama and say, "Hey, say I'm funny," something I couldn't just do that. Like Correct. something happened there where he was in the same room with him for some reason. You know what I mean? Correct. But what Dan does is put this spin on it that makes you immediately be like, "What?" Well, like, like it's kind of like the glazed grazed donut joke that we'll hear about in a minute, but. It's kind of like that in the sense that it's like, okay, you do a hacky joke. Why are you now committed to the fact that it happened? You know what I mean? Like, why are you promoting this? Like, 
Obama says I'm fucking hilarious. It's like, it's just a, a thing people are going to call you out for lying. Obama doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know your comedy. You think Obama today, 10 years later, is like, I got to check out some of that Dan Dine and stuff. What's I, I he miss, up to? I miss him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, next, we got uh, uh, him getting asked about his age. Yeah, this is another weird uh, evasion, and he kept this up. This is just one clip. I could have had 40 of them. He kept this up for the three hours. Every time his age came up, it was this bit. And he would not relent. No matter how unfunny it was, he stuck to this. Are you, are you saying you're 33 years old? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm 74. I no, just turned. but jokes aside, I mean, this is a serious... You can't say your age. This is where it comes from, though. If you can't say how old you are... What, what difference does it make? Why is that so important? But why is it so... Yes, exactly. Why is it so important? <laughs> Why, Why do you important? care so much? <laughs> well, I'm 74. I'm telling you, I look amazing for You're 74. You're not 74. <laughs> I'm 74. But if you were, <laughs> he he would not break this bit the whole time where he's saying this age. He still clearly isn't because he knows that'll be like, oh well, we all know he's not 74, so maybe he's probably just telling his real age. I guess at least in yeah. his mind, that's how we'll think about it. And to Patrick's point, yeah, no, why does it matter? Why can't you say you're a, what's the big deal if you're 54? Be because I guess realistically, like, if you're passing for 33, which I don't imagine he is, but if you're passing for 33, what's the fucking difference, I suppose, you know? Yeah. That's almost more amazing that you're getting these roles passing for 33 and you're in your 50s. Yeah, you should brag about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that's very impressive. But... <laughs> He does this the whole time. And you keep thinking as you watch the three and a half hour interview, you keep thinking, well, Patrick's mentioning it enough and it's coming up enough that eventually he's going to be like, no, okay, of course I'm not 74. I was born in, you know, uh, 1959 or whatever. But he will, he will not let up on that. It's a thing. He's very concerned about his image. And again, if he's making the money he says he's making, it works for him. But he's not living a happy life. And I think if he were more honest with himself, maybe uh, some of this other stuff that he gets worked up about wouldn't matter to him. Yeah, next we have uh, him talking about that true story. Oh, this is the, like I said, I've been teasing his response to the glazed, grazed donut. It's <laughs> stunning that he's dying on this hill. Insane. You can just be like, dude, I do stand up. I have to make jokes. Done. It's I mean, fucking Chappelle and Louis do it. Where the, Literally, Louis is known for saying like uh, it was uh, last week or was it two weeks ago it doesn't fucking matter i'm lying like <laughs> yeah, yeah. it doesn't have not everything has to be true so why are you why are you so committed to this this is now here's the thing the thing is this is a true story okay this is a true story this is not something this is I'm, what i'm saying you maintain this is a true your I'm, dad and your mom we're driving to dulles airport we see these cows grazing how old were you in this story i i was a kid all right. So we're, we're, 38. We're, yeah. So we're, we're, we're driving yeah. to the airport. We see these cows way out in the field. And my dad's like, hey, that's a word that can have a lot of different meanings. Right. Like, for example, cows can graze. And then I said, you can be grazed by a bull. Hold on, but who's driving along and just goes, that's a word that can have a lot of meanings. Because nobody Patrick. said graze. How did, how did graze come up? No, no. Well, no, no, no. That. Oh, OK. Uh, they, we saw you wouldn't cows. just be driving along, see a cow and go, that's a word that has a lot of meaning. What cow? Yeah, I guess someone's in the car that said, you know, grazed or okay. grazing or something like I that. Yes. And, and the That's one thing I wish Patrick pushed him on is like, Dan does a lot of things throughout this interview where he's like, oh, well, then I guess just something. Someone said graze, I guess. <laughs> well, did it? Because you seem to have a perfect memory of this and you're swearing it's true. So did someone say graze? And who in the car could possibly pronounce that correctly? Apparently no one. No, nobody. <laughs> his mom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, we have him talking. This, this is always my favorite part of Dan Nine is the Russell Peters angle. I, I enjoy it so much. That's that's the weirdest one. So he starts talking about his his um, relationship with Russell Peters, and like I said, a lot of it was long and repetitive and convoluted. So I, I don't I don't know that I even have the perfect clips to describe. I'll do my best to fill in the blanks here. Uh, but this is him talking about meeting Russell Peters. So you started working with him in 2005. How and how did that come about? How did you get the gig? I mean, okay, so late 2004, I went to the uh, Improv because I'd heard about this huge phenomenon going on, Russell Peters, and I get to the Improv. Check the kid out. Hold on one second. I, I this is totally unrelated to Dan. 
has Russell Peters been around that long? Has he been huge for 20 years? He's been he's been around for a very long time. Yeah. I didn't realize if that if that lines up correctly, I I can't trust this guy's timeline. But if that's true that in 2004 people were like, you got to see Russell Peters. That's a wild run that he has had. That's crazy. Good for <laughs> yeah. Him. yeah, that in uh, I like how he said I started in 2001 doing stand up right because 9 11. Right. So in 2004 he's going. I'm gonna go check this kid out, Russell Peters. Yeah, yeah, this young up and comer. Yeah, three years in, I'm I'm three years in and nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I don't have my driver's license yet, but I'm gonna go check this guy out. <laughs> All right, sorry, let's continue. Too late. Excuse me. He's just finished performing. Just finished, and the crowd. You know, he, I literally must have gotten there like ten seconds after he got off stage. Okay. Because there was like this this amazing just this something in the air. You know, something amazing had happened. Right, and then. The producer or whatever That's comes nice up, of him or to the, say. the club owner comes up, or manager says, "Hey, these people don't want to leave." Hold on, can I just point something out real quick and go back just a little bit because I don't want to step on too much of this. But it, every story is like, and the club owner or manager or someone came up to me. It's like you seem to have a pretty vivid memory of this story. How do you not know who came up to you? Is he the best third year comic that's ever existed? Well, that I mean, that's another thing. But I'm just saying, in the telling of his stories. They clearly seem like it's like the fucking uh, John Lovitz character where he's like, and, you know, the, the club owner or was it the it was the manager. That's who came up to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the air, you know, something amazing had happened. Right. And then the producer or whatever comes up or the, the club owner comes up or a manager says, hey, these people don't want to leave. Do you have any other Indian comedians? I said, I will do it. Comes up to who? Who did he, who was he asking? To the producer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, his name was Ash. And and so after Russell Peters does an hour or whatever it was, I don't know how or long whatever. It was. I, I mean, I, nobody I does an hour at the Hollywood Improv, but whatever. 30 minutes, no, no, 40 no, this, minutes, whatever. This is the New York Improv. Oh, okay. New York Improv. Yeah. Um, after that, they want to put just another comic up and they, ha- they want to put another Indian comic up. So, they, you know, for, the, uh, for, the, for the layman out there, for anyone that doesn't quite know, They've dropped the checks. Everyone's paid their bill, and Russell has done an hour. Everyone's satisfied and getting up and going home. And yet someone runs in and says, we need an Indian. Is there an Indian in the house? <laughs> He's like, and luckily, Dan Ninen was with an earshot, apparently. I happen to be an Indian comedian. <laughs> yeah. Which also, why would it need to be an Indian? Because they were there to see? It's not like Russell just dropped in randomly. No, it's not, if he's doing an hour, it was pre-planned. I, 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 I don't, I don't understand any of it so far. But Dan's gonna clear it up, I'm sure. Comics, I happen to be standing right there. Yeah, right. And then I said, I will do it. Right. And by the way, anyone watching along, you can just see the lies on this guy's face. New comedian says, "I will do it," and the club owner says, "Perfect." <laughs> excellent guy i've never met get on there follow russell peters and they put me on how long are you you, so you were two years in three years in uh yeah three years in okay so then they uh, you know i did like 10 15 minutes i didn't think i did that well did they know you they just were like sure go ahead you're an indian comic well um maybe ash ash did no 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 the improv didn't know me no and so then uh you know, Russell, even in his own life, he's not confident enough with his own lies to be like, yeah, of course they knew me. He's like, no, they didn't. And yet they just took a get. They said, kid, get up there. We think you I don't know what it is, but you've got it. <laughs> Back to the future. <laughs> yeah, with the phone. You know, that new sound you're looking for. <laughs> well, he gets his sushi at 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I had done that well, but then again, come on, I'm following Russell Peters, right? I'm following Russell Peters. And but how did even the logistics of that work? So not not to be, you know, everybody's devil's advocate here, but on both sides. But Russell finishes, the MC goes back up. Meanwhile, the manager's over off to the side going, Do you have any more Indian comics? How does the MC get word that you're even going up? The MC thinks the show's over. He closed it out. Logistically, how do you get brought up on the stage? The MC doesn't know you or that you're there. And I, and it's usually going up like, give it up for Russell Peters. Give it up for all the comments you see tonight. Thank you guys. Good night. 
Oh, like, oh. you would it would have been over. No, no, no. When, when I got there, there was literally like the crowd was there was no one on stage, and the crowd was just kind of sitting there, right? So uh, I guess the MC I gotta say, I've never been. I've never been to a club in New York. I've never been to like the cellar or the stand or any place like that. But I don't believe in the amount of comedy shows I have been to. I don't believe that Russell Peters gets off stage. The MC says, "Thanks, guys. Good night," and the crowd just sitting there, saying, "Boy, I hope." I hope a young Indian comedian comes up here. They start chanting, one more Indian comic. One more. <laughs> Is Dan Nyden back there? <laughs> Peters, give it up for all the comments you've seen tonight. Thank you guys. Good night. Oh, like, oh. You would've, it would have been over. No, no, no. When, when I got there, there was literally, like, the crowd was, there was no one on stage, and the crowd was just kind of sitting there, right? So uh, I guess the MC must have gotten off and said, hey, you know, that's Russell Peters, and okay. thank you. But no, by the time... Yeah, so it's just like ah, you know, I don't know. I get, I guess this is what happened. It's like you were there, Dan. Now, now me telling Dan's story, I think I have some liberties to say. I guess this is what happened. And I guess this is how they got here because I have no fucking idea. I wasn't there for any of it. I'm reading stuff and listening to stuff and watching stuff online. Dan saying, "I guess this is what I guess that happened. And I guess this happened." You're the only witness to this, Dan. What do you mean you guess? You'd think it sounds like a career making moment, if true, that you would remember every detail. <laughs> That's true, too. It's so much so that Russell stayed and watched him and said, like, hey, great job, kid. He threw him the mean Joe Green Jack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that it or is that anymore? Uh, we have one more clip. Um, okay. uh, him, uh, it says opening. I'm guessing. Yeah, so well. this, is, this is how he became uh, Russell's opener, I guess. How does the club make money? Why do they want you on stage? Yeah, because checks have been closed out. Yeah, the checks, yeah, the right. checks already been closed out. Why do they want the crowd to stay? Wouldn't they want them to leave? There's no more money to be made. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> That's not a great answer, Dan. <laughs> there has to be some reason. Because wouldn't you have asked, like, everyone's getting up and walking out. Why would you have me go out there? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, I don't know? Just something cosmically forced all these people to be glued to their seats and be like, certainly, even though they told us to leave... And we've paid our tab. Something magic is about to happen. We could feel it. <laughs> it was just contact info and says, yeah, come do some gigs with me. No, no, no. And then this was in late 2000. <laughs> I defrauded the internet by making it seem like I was. <laughs> no, 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 Patrick, you silly goose. I stole his identity. <laughs> and he had no choice but to acknowledge me. And then this was in late 2004. And then, then I heard uh, from a friend that Russell was going to be coming to the States. Okay. Right. And then, so uh, I called him. He's already he, in the States. He, he lives here, sir. The first time you saw him, that's where he was. <laughs> New York city. <laughs> Ever heard of it? Hey, do you mind if I do some shows with you? Right. And he goes, yeah, I'll tell him. I, I said, do you mind if I do like one or two of the shows or whatever? You know, can I do, can I open for you? He goes, I'll tell my manager to put you on every show. And I hold said, on. whoa, 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 whoa. I emailed a guy I met once. <laughs> he's, he's just been on an international tour. He's coming back. And I said, may I open for you? He said, I'll tell you, I'll tell my manager to put you on every show. Not only can you open for me, you're the only guy I want. <laughs> Stranger. <laughs> i'll tell my manager to put you on every show and i said oh wow thank you so much and he goes one hand washes the other <laughs> i'm sure he did doesn't mean anything <laughs> one hand washes the other so he said so russell peters the the richest comedian in comedy let's for, for argument's sake let's call him the richest mm -hmm. he says hey dan one hand washes the other i mean you could you're gonna be doing me favors eventually <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Russell so, Peters net worth 75 million. <laughs> I'm I'm surprised that's it's it's that low honestly. I feel like <laughs> you know almost that every year. <laughs> yeah, cuz I well, I know like Kevin Hart does movies and commercials and shit like that. But like mm -hmm. for stand-up gigs, I think he makes more than Kevin Hart. For sure. At least internationally. So Internationally in the states no, but internationally definitely. He'll perform in Dubai. Like I'm so I'm yeah. sure you know what I mean like just all over the place. So uh, but yeah, so Dan, I, I suggest going and watching that whole thing. If you were interested in this and this wasn't too long for you, then go yeah. go watch the whole Patrick Melton interview. It's interesting. I will say, like, 
as someone who was watching it for our purposes, I wish that Patrick held his feet to the fire a little more on certain things. But you get there. You can tell in the way he answers about a lot. Of, like with the Marin thing, they play the Marin clips for him, and he says, oh, that clearly that's someone impersonating me. And he holds on to this. He goes, why won't Marin say my name if it's me then? As if that's some sort of proof. And they keep saying, well, he says why. He won't say your name. He doesn't want to give you clout. Right. And he's like, I don't know. If he's not saying my name, it can't be me. And it's like, well, with that logic, it's not anybody. Marin's making it up then, <laughs> you know? Um, for uh, context, for how well um, Russell Peters does, yeah, net worth of $17 million. Bill Burr's is $14 million. <laughs> Well, yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> so yeah, Russell's a very successful guy. And he just wa- one hand washes the other, baby. He wanted Dan Niner around. <laughs> So if you guys know, so Dan, like his Twitter is, uh, he bought, uh, there was another article written about him was, um, you know, he, he's kind of like bragging about buying followers, how easy it is to buy followers. He bought like a hundred thousand followers or something. So if you look Dan up on Twitter, this was great for a while. I don't even know if he tweets anymore, but, um, you know, he has, has a hundred thousand followers or maybe even more than that. And he'll have a tweet with two likes. <laughs> It's like by accident, people of ten people would like your tweet if you have that many followers. Yeah, that like when you're scrolling through Twitter and you accidentally click the like the like. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you guys know any updates on Dan Nine, and there's not a lot out there, all of his stuff is from you know ten years ago. Um, so if you guys have any updates, let me know, and we'll do a Dan Nine in part two because I'm endlessly fascinated by this guy. Oh, the yeah. um, the depth of the well, like I said, uh, kind of dries up, but. Uh, if you guys know more that I didn't find, then let me know. If you like episodes like this and have someone you want to suggest, like a Vince, I mentioned the name, v- people bring up Vince Champ all the time. Um, we'll do him eventually. But if there are more characters like that, you know, these obscure, weird guys in comedy that you may not know their name, but there's uh, certainly a story to be told, then let me know. And uh, the best place to let me know is blindmike.net. That's where you can find our Patreon. You get these episodes a week early as well as bonus episodes. Um and uh, you can become a YouTube member as well if that's easier for you. Uh, or you can subscribe to the show for, show for free wherever you get podcasts. Um, also, if you haven't checked out my other shows, uh, Blind Mike Project and Who Are These Socials, those links are at blindmike.net as well. Subscribe to the YouTube, all of that. And if you want to support the Craigster, go to verygoodshow.org. That's where his program is, his Patreon. And like I said, he's trying out a new uh, uh, true crime podcast. So if you want to check that out, go check out Rubbed Out as well. Yes, and uh, it, no, no matter where you listen to podcasts on either website, if you click, uh, it will have a link to where you're going. So it's even easier than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts, all the links are there. So uh, we will talk to you guys. Now nah, I'm trying to think if I missed anything. I don't think so. Goodbye. Talk to you next time on Why Are You Laughing. Zip it up and zip it out. Yeah.